Hello, I'm Eric Strong from Strong Medicine, and today in this ongoing video series on an approach to symptoms, I'll be discussing an approach to male infertility. As with other videos in this series, this will focus only on the etiologies and evaluation of infertility, not on the treatment of specific disorders. First, how do we define infertility? Infertility is unusual among medical conditions in that it is usually defined in terms of two patients, not one. The most common definition is an inability of a couple to achieve conception despite 12 months of frequent unprotected intercourse. That 12-month duration is arbitrary and is a little situation dependent. For example, how long to wait prior to a fertility evaluation is largely dependent on the age of the female partner. For some couples, they may wait up to two years of unsuccessful conception before an evaluation when the woman is in her 20s, while an evaluation might be undertaken after only six months when the woman is above 35. This distinction is because of the declining fertility with maternal age, leaving less time for observation while the window to conceive is closing. Although fertility also declines for men with age, the impact of age is much less pronounced. Infertility is relatively common, affecting around 10 to 15 percent of couples actively trying to conceive. Regarding the etiologies of infertility, in most couples, one clear single etiology is not established. Instead, in most cases, multiple potential contributing factors are identified instead. And a significant number of cases remain idiopathic, despite a workup for both partners. Here's a rough breakdown of uncovered etiologies and contributing factors. I've left off the numerical percentages because they vary quite a bit between different sources, but across the board, in a little less than half of couples, an evaluation only identifies female factors, meaning either definitive etiologies or potential contributing factors. In around a quarter, the evaluation identifies only male factors. In another quarter or so, factors are identified in both partners and a small but non-negligible number of couples have no contributing factors identified in either one. This graph highlights the fact that when a couple is experiencing infertility, it is important to evaluate both partners, which is why this series has a companion video on an approach to female infertility. To best understand the specific etiologies of male infertility, it will be helpful to spend a few minutes reviewing the relevant physiology and anatomy of the male reproductive system. The male reproductive system is regulated by a series of hormones that begins with one called GnRH, which stands for gonadotropin-releasing hormone. This is produced in the hypothalamus, a region of the brain located on its inferior aspect, which is involved in regulating the autonomic nervous system and a variety of homeostatic systems related to sleep, body temperature, and our hormones. The hypothalamus sends GnRH down a thin stalk of tissue called the infundibulum into the anterior pituitary gland, an endocrine organ located just below the brain. In response to GnRH, the anterior pituitary produces and releases two hormones into the bloodstream, LH, which stands for luteinizing hormone, and FSH, which stands for follicle-stimulating hormone. If you're wondering about those names, these hormones are named for their functions in the female reproductive system, but they are the same molecules as in males in whom they travel via the bloodstream to the testes. In the testes, LH specifically stimulates the production of testosterone. Testosterone in turn stimulates the process of spermatogenesis, which is the creation of sperm cells, themselves also known as spermatozoa. Testosterone also displays negative feedback in which it inhibits the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary from releasing GnRH and LH and FSH respectively. Any disruption of the sequence can result in a disruption of spermatogenesis. Knowledge of the relationships between hormones helps with diagnosis. For example, if a male is experiencing infertility and LH and FSH are unusually low, it suggests the problem is located in either the hypothalamus or anterior pituitary. Whereas if those hormones are unusually high, it suggests a lack of negative inhibition from the testes, suggesting that the testes themselves are the problem. In addition to the reproductive hormones, male fertility is also dependent on anatomy. Once the testes produce spermatozoa, 
those spermatozoa need to mature and be stored until they are released during sexual intercourse. The storage and maturation of spermatozoa predominantly occurs in the epididymis, located within the scrotum on the posterior superior aspect of the testes. During sexual arousal and ejaculation, mature spermatozoa are propelled through bilateral tubes, individually called the vas deferens, which, as the image shows, have a somewhat circuitous route from the epididymis over the bladder, past the seminal vesicles, which provide nutrients for the spermatozoa, at which point the conduit is known as the ejaculatory duct, as it continues through the prostate before joining with the urethra, which exits the body at the tip of the penis. Any anatomic or functional obstruction along that route can result in infertility. Before I talk about the individual etiologies of male infertility, there are a few additional terms to review. Hypogonadism refers to a decrease in either testosterone and or spermatogenesis. There are two main categories. Primary hypogonadism refers to problems with spermatogenesis and or the testes. Secondary hypogonadism, also referred to as hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, refers to problems with the hypothalamus or pituitary. Regarding spermatogenesis, azoospermia refers to an absence of spermatozoa in the ejaculate, and oligozoospermia refers to a decrease in the concentration of spermatozoa in the ejaculate, but not total absence. So now the etiologies. In my opinion, the most logical of diagnostic frameworks places the etiologies into four general categories. First is primary hypogonadism, which is more or less synonymous with defective spermatogenesis. There is a problem with the testes themselves, which prevent the normal production of functioning motile spermatozoa. This category can be further broken down into genetic and acquired disorders. The most common genetic cause of primary hypogonadism include Klinefelter syndrome, which is a chromosomal abnormality in which instead of 46 chromosomes, including two sex chromosomes, X and Y, the patient actually has 47 chromosomes with an extra X sex chromosome. Klinefelter syndrome has a spectrum of clinical severity ranging from asymptomatic to signs of decreased testosterone noticeable after puberty, such as gynecomastia and sexual dysfunction, to early onset osteoporosis, tall stature, and intellectual disability. Another congenital disorder is a Y chromosome microdeletion, in which a tiny but important part of the Y chromosome that controls spermatogenesis is missing. A genetic disease called androgen insensitivity syndrome can also cause infertility, in which the androgen receptor contains a mutation that prevents testosterone from binding to it normally. As with Klinefelter syndrome, the spectrum of disease is very variable, with some individuals having an XY karyotype but otherwise conventional female phenotype, some are XY individuals born with ambiguous genitalia, and others are phenotypic males with infertility, small penis, and gynecomastia. The acquired disorders of primary hypogonadism include advanced age, although as previously mentioned, this is less of a factor for males as compared to females. A varicocele is a common problem in which veins within the scrotum are unusually dilated. There are multiple competing theories as to how precisely this leads to infertility. Infertility can also be the consequence of viral orchitis, or, viral, or a viral infection of the testes, most classically caused by mumps. It can also be the delayed consequence of testicular trauma or torsion, the latter of which occurs when a testicle twists on its own blood supply, leading to ischemia. Drugs that are associated with hypogonadism include a variety of chemotherapeutics. Last in this category is idiopathic spermatogenic failure, which is when a patient has a low concentration or total absence of spermatozoa, but without any identifiable cause. This situation may be due to an as-of-yet undiscovered genetic disease. However, as we have observed average sperm counts declining over the past 50 years, it seems probable that there are also uncharacterized environmental factors as well. The next large category in our diagnostic framework is predictably secondary hypogonadism problems with the hypothalamus and pituitary. These can also be subdivided into genetic and acquired disorders. The genetic causes of secondary hypogonadism are rare, 
and include both anosmic and non-anosmic GnRH deficiency. Anosmia is a lack of smell. Genetic diseases can also impact the structure and function of LH and FSH, but these are profoundly rare. Acquired secondary hypogonadism includes virtually any pathology of the hypothalamus or pituitary, including cysts and tumors, head trauma, and infiltrative diseases such as sarcoidosis, hemochromatosis, and something called Langerhans cell histiocytosis. However, it would be unusual for infertility to be the sole presenting symptom of any of these problems. Radiation to the base of the head for cancer therapy can damage these structures. Also, hyperprolactinemia, for example, from a prolactin secreting pituitary adenoma, can cause infertility by generally dysregulating the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. Drugs that are well established causes of secondary hypogonadism include corticosteroids, such as chronic prednisone, opioids, and anabolic steroids. In addition to the two forms of hypogonadism, there are sperm transport disorders, in which spermatogenesis is intact, but there is a problem with getting the spermatozoa from the testes to outside of the body. This includes dysfunction of the epididymis, which can be the consequence of a sexually transmitted infection, but is also seen in cystic fibrosis. It includes anatomic abnormalities of the vas deferens, which can be congenitally absent in cystic fibrosis. And it includes retrograde ejaculation, in which during ejaculation, instead of semen being propelled forward out of the penis, it is propelled backwards into the bladder. The last category is other or miscellaneous. This includes infrequent vaginal intercourse and sexual dysfunction. When evaluating infertility, do not assume that your patient is fully informed about normal sexual function and the sexual activity necessary for fertilization and conception. Infertility can also be completely idiopathic. Idiopathic infertility differs from idiopathic spermatogenic failure and that in the former, semen analysis is normal. In addition to all these etiologies listed, there are also risk factors for male infertility which may lack a clear, well-understood mechanism, but which nevertheless have been observed to have an association. These include any severe systemic disease, for example, cirrhosis and chronic kidney disease, smoking, heavy alcohol recreational drug use, obesity, and malnutrition. As with all the videos in this series on approach to symptoms, I'd like to indicate which of the many etiologies are the most common. Unfortunately, with male infertility, the most common scenarios are either idiopathic spermatogenic failure or general idiopathic infertility. One additional point to mention here is that varicoceles are very common in general, so some have proposed that they are one of the most common causes of male infertility. However, since the majority of men with a varicocele are not infertile, it remains uncertain how often a known varicocele is the primary cause. How do we evaluate the male partner of a couple experiencing infertility? Starting with the history, ask about the duration of infertility and take a sexual history, including the frequency and timing of intercourse and the presence of any form of sexual dysfunction, such as erectile dysfunction or premature ejaculation. A complete medical and surgical history, including a thorough GU history. This includes a history of cryptorchidism or undescended testes, a history of testicular torsion or trauma, and a history of prostatitis or sexually transmitted infections. A medication history, including prior use of anabolic steroids, which can lead to a period of infertility lasting for months after their cessation. A sexual development history, including age of puberty and the presence of any abnormalities in the development of secondary sex characteristics. Does the patient have a family history of fertility problems that would suggest a genetic explanation. A thorough social history, including alcohol or drug use, smoking, extreme exercise, or psychological stress. And exposure history, including but not limited to a history of either medical or occupational radiation. A focused physical exam should start with vitals, including height and body mass index. The exam should also include an assessment of secondary sex characteristics, such as the distribution of body hair and the presence of gynecomastia. And of course, a GU exam, including an assessment of penile, testicular, and epididymal size, 
presence of a varicocele, and the presence of hypospadias or epispadias, which are abnormalities in the location of the opening of the urethra. The most important diagnostic test for uh, a male experiencing infertility is semen analysis, which includes measurement of total volume, sperm concentration, motility, and morphology. Sometimes other tests are ordered on semen, such as semen pH or semen culture, but these appear to be of limited diagnostic utility. Depending on the results of the semen analysis, one might next pursue scrotal and or transrectal ultrasound to look for evidence of anatomic obstruction. One can measure testosterone, LH, FSH, and plus or minus prolactin. Karyotyping the patient is often done in cases with low sperm concentration to look for Klinefelter syndrome. When sperm counts are extremely low, Y-chromosome microdeletion analysis is also done. And in cases of unexplained anatomic obstruction or when there is a relevant family history, analysis of the CFTR gene may be done to look for cystic fibrosis. CFTR stands for Cystic Fibrosis Transmembrane Conductance Regulator. Now, how can we put all of these questions and tests together into a diagnostic algorithm that we can use on an individual patient? Start with a thorough history and physical exam, focusing on those things previously mentioned. If a specific systemic disease, including genetic disease or sexual dysfunction, is already suggested at this point, then pursue additional workup as indicated. On the other hand, if nothing from the history and exam points to a specific direction, the next step is universally semen analysis, which serves as a screening test for most significant causes of male infertility. If all components of the semen analysis are normal, there is usually no additional workup for the male partner. The male could still be the source of infertility, as semen analysis is not an adequate surrogate for several key spermatozoa-specific steps leading to fertilization. However, we do not currently have reliable, cost-effective, commercially available tests to detect problems in these steps. If the semen volume is low, but the analysis is otherwise normal, this suggests either an incomplete collection or partial retrograde ejaculation, the latter of which can be diagnosed by seeing high numbers of spermatozoa in the microscopic analysis of post-orgasmic urine. If there is decreased spermatozoa concentration, irrespective of volume, the next step is imaging of the GU system with either scrotal and or transrectal ultrasound, along with measurements of testosterone, LH, and FSH. If imaging finds genital tract obstruction, further evaluate as indicated. If there is no obstruction, testosterone is low, and LH and FSH are high, it is consistent with primary hypogonadism. In this case, the next step is karyotype, and if sperm concentration is extremely low, Y chromosome microdeletion analysis. And if there is no obstruction, testosterone is low, and LH and FSH are either low or normal, that is consistent with secondary hypogonadism. In that case, the next steps are a prolactin level, to consider screening for other endocrinopathies that could uncover more global pathology of the hypothalamic pituitary axis, and to consider cellular imaging, such as an MRI scan. The cella is the tiny concavity in the base of the skull. That's the location of the pituitary gland. If the only abnormality on semen analysis is either one of morphology or motility, it's consistent, though not diagnostic, of rare genetic causes that are otherwise outside the scope of this particular video. Additional workup should be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Finally, remember that the infertility workup should include an assessment of the female partner, which is usually done in parallel or simultaneously with the male assessment. The key takeaway points of this video. Infertility is most commonly defined as an inability to conceive despite 12 months of frequent unprotected intercourse. It requires an evaluation of both partners. Most etiologies of male infertility can be characterized as either primary hypogonadism, which includes problems with spermatogenesis in the testes, or secondary hypogonadism, which includes problems with the hypothalamus or pituitary's regulation of sex hormones. Common tests during the evaluation include semen analysis, 
and in some cases, scrotal and or transrectal ultrasound, levels of testosterone, LH, FSH, and sometimes prolactin, and karyotyping. Despite an appropriate evaluation, male infertility often remains idiopathic. That's it for this video on an approach to male infertility. If you have not already done so, be sure to also check out the accompanying video on an approach to female infertility.